Okay, thank you, Mickey. Good to see everyone this morning. I want to tell you about a gentleman by the name of Douglas Corrigan. Douglas Corrigan lived during the time when there were aviation pioneers in America. Great things were happening in the world of aviation. Douglas Corrigan was a part of that. He lived during the time of Amelia Earhart and Howard Hughes, Charles Lindbergh, all those guys. And those milestones uh, were happening, uh, the fastest across this and the fastest across that. During that time, uh, Douglas Corrigan, you had to apply with the United States government before you could fly across the Atlantic Ocean. And he did so. He applied three different times, three separate times, and three separate times he was turned down to fly across the Atlantic because really, basically his plane was held together with baling twine and juicy fruit gum. I don't know why I said juicy fruit, Harvey. But, but so they denied that. So what he decided to do, he was going to fly from California to New York, and he did that. And when he did that, he broke a land speed record in doing that. And uh, unfortunately, he didn't get much publicity out of that because at the same time that he did that, Howard Hughes flew across the Atlantic. Howard Hughes came back to a, 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 one of those parades where all the papers flying everywhere. What do you call it? Ticket? Ticker. Tick, tick. Ticker tape. Tick. 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 That was it. The, it. It all came on Howard Hughes, and he had uh, dinner with uh, all the movers and shakers at the time, and Corrigan was just standing there watching all that happen, and he didn't get any publicity, which is what he wanted. So what he did, instead of getting invited to the mover and shaker dinner, he filled up the the plane with gas and uh, took off, headed back to California. And, if, and some hours later, he landed in Ireland. <laughs> and uh, he said that he had flown above the clouds. He didn't see where he was going, no landmarks. And uh, he, he, you know, the compass wasn't working. And of course, the government, when, when they heard about it, they thought he did it on purpose. And they thought that he did it uh, you know, to gain publicity. And well... He denied that. He denied flying the wrong way. Even till his death, 1995, when he died, he, he still said that he did it by accident and, and he didn't do it. But anyway, the New York Post gave him some publicity during that time, and they published a headline. They, they wrote an article about what he had done. He's heading to California. He ends up in Ireland. But he got a lot of publicity because uh, they called him Wrong Way Corrigan. Wrong way, Corrigan. And, and that's a, a name that stuck. You don't remember him as Douglas Corrigan, but wrong way, Corrigan. There's a verse in the Bible that's repeated twice, that is repeated word for word. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. It's also in Proverbs 16. The passage is this. Solomon says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The wisdom literature, the Proverbs, Solomon, when he wrote this book early on in Proverbs chapter 7, he's talking about a young man. Actually, he's talking to his son about a young man. As he looks out the window, sees this young man, and he sees him uh, going out in the twilight. And what he sees him doing, he sees this young man mistaking lust for love, uh, mistaking sex for intimacy. And he tells his boy that he witnesses this young man going at the wrong place, the wrong time, with the wrong person. And what happens, he, it cost him his life. It caught, he's killed in the hands or by the hands of a jealous husband. And, and this way, as Solomon is telling him this, all of these things seemed right to him. But the end certainly was the way of his death. How many times do we see individuals in circumstances, as we're, as we're thinking about our life, we, we, look, we look at what's going on in other people's lives, and we say, boy, you know what? This is just going the wrong way. They're going the wrong way about all of this. This thing's not going to end up in a good way. It's going to be wrong. There's lots of pictures in the magic box now that you can get, the, the, the computer, and, and Facebook's just full of memes and different pictures. I, I like the one where the FedEx driver, 13-foot trailer, 12-foot clearance of the overpass, and there he's stuck, you know. We were talking about someplace in North Carolina, Brent, a bridge. Or, 
has his own YouTube channel. How many times this guy's going to get ramrodded underneath? You know, the guy's got an actual uh, number of times each month that, that they, they don't make that overpass. And you look at that, I'll tell you, why would that happen? Well, it's FedEx driver, that's why. But <laughs> no brown giant driver would ever do that. But you think, what, what's wrong with that? Why would he not know that? I got, I'm a driver. I, I got a 13-foot trailer, 12-foot, let us try. It's, it's not going to work. You know that's not going to happen. You know those things aren't going to work. But, but we see that all the time, and yet, why don't people see that? You see the married couple whose husband is, is, is you know, he spends a lot of time away. He's working all the time. The wife uh, into everything but their marriage. A lot of time on social media, and you look at that, and then when they're together, they really don't seem like they're getting along too well. And you think, you know what? That's not going to work. That's not going to end in a good situation. You see sometimes a young person. Here, here's a young person who begins to date, and to date someone serious who's not a Christian. They're not a Christian, and you think, you know, I, I don't know. It might seem right to you, but I don't, I don't know if that's going to work out. And, and, you, and, and all of a sudden, their, their morals might change. They begin to look at things that they've held sacred as far as the church goes, as far as what they've always believed. And they begin to doubt that and question that. They begin to rebel in ways. Their parents see things going on. It's like, never seen this happening before. And, and everybody can see that situation. That's not going to be good. That, that's not good. And it begins to have an impact on them. Well... I have a young family. I know a couple of families like this. Both great jobs. The, the, the young husband, the young wife, they both got great jobs. They're making all kinds of money financially. They're doing great. But the thing of it is they're not, they're not putting anything away. And, and they're spending more than they make. That's, that, that's always possible. And, and, you, and what happens when the, the economy has a downturn? Or maybe there's a layoff. You know that that's not going to end well. And you can see that happening to them. A couple of questions this morning. First, why does the wrong way seem right? I mean, that's what he says. There's a way that seems right. Why does the wrong way seem right to us all the time? And to a lot of folks. And, 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 and again, Solomon says, and, and if everybody is that you know, that you can see, is headed in that direction, why can't they see it? Why can we see it? But why can't they see it? You know, often I think we've wondered. We've all witnessed people that we care about, know, and love. And, and we've seen them. I mean, why, why does it take a divorce? Why, why does it take a divorce? For the light to go on. Why, why does it take an arrest? Why does it take jail time? Why, why does it take withdrawal of fellowship? For an unfaithful Christian, before the light goes on, and that wait, you know what? I've, I've been going the wrong way. Why, why does it get to that point? Why does it take becoming broke, friendless, homeless? You're in a place like the prodigal, and you never dreamed that you'd be there, but you look up, the light goes on. How, how do I possibly, how do I wind up here like this? I mean, it's just like a block. You never see it coming. Why is it like that? Why in the world does it take that before an individual opens their eyes and says, boy, it seemed like the right way, but it's not the right way. But it takes getting to that point. For some folks, I think the realization of that comes late, too late. Because in all of our lives, there are tipping points. And a lot of times when that tipping point comes, it's absolutely impossible to get back to where you need to be. A lot of folks come to the preacher or come to the scriptures or come to the point in their life and I'm telling you what, their, their life is like, here's this egg, let's do it and do it and scramble it. And then they look at you and say they want to get their life all back together and just put in that egg like, it just doesn't happen. It's impossible for that to happen. How many families have been permanently affected by immorality? How many families have been permanently affected by abuse, whether mental or physical? And, and, and these things that, that just won't go away because someone in your life has decided that the way seemed right. We look at those things. And we can clearly see those things in the Bible. We look at those situations in the Bible and we think, 
How did they not see it coming? Here Eve is talking to a serpent. Here David's looking at Bathsheba. And, and you think about Lot's wife. They're leaving and, and she turns around. And you think about Nadab and Abihu. They're, they're offering something that God didn't authorize. Here Ananias and Sapphira are. They're, they're, saying, they're lying to an apostle. And, and we look at those examples, and I mean, we read those things, we say, Eve, what, what are you thinking, Eve? This, this isn't going to be good. David, don't look. Don't offer. Don't look back. Don't lie. Because it may seem right. And again, you think about these examples, you look at But how many times have every one of us engaged with our adversary, the devil? How many times have... You looked at someone you ought not to look at or something you ought not to look at. How many times? How many times has it been more convenient to kind of lie? It's a lot easier to do that. How many times have you done that? This morning I just want to talk about the simple statement that Solomon made. Because for some reason this month I've heard it a thousand times. Boy, it seems right. It just seems right. That's got to be right. And I've heard that over and over. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Two questions. Two questions we'll address. Why can't we see? Why can't we see that the way just seems right, but the end is death? I'll tell you one way I think is that we become, and I'm just going to say disoriented. One of the reasons that we can't see that this way is going to lead to death is that I believe that we become disoriented with, and I, and I mean, it, it seems right, and how many, th- how many things in your life can you go, boy, that seems right, and you can just name off a thousand things that seems right. I can. A lot of things just seem right. It makes sense that, that I should be able to do whatever I want to do. That seems right. Whatever makes me happy, that, that seems right. And I, I think it, you know, it makes sense that I might occasionally lie, doesn't it? That seems right. To kind of get myself out of trouble, I mean, that just seems right. And it makes sense that the church, that your religion, that your faith, that it all just be fun and games and whatever you want it to be and however you want it to be. And why do we have to have rules that are imposed by God? That doesn't seem right, does it? No, we don't need that. And it makes sense that, that this is the way God made me. That makes sense. Why are you like that? Well, it just seems right that this is the way God made me. If I'm a racist, I'm a racist. God made me that. If I'm homosexual, God made me this way. If I'm a a, a chronic liar, if I'm a chronic thief, if I'm all of those things, and that just makes sense to me that God made me that way. Makes sense to me that we should all just find our own way to God. Don't you think? That makes sense. And that sounds good. After all, we're all individuals. It just seems right that all of us ought to have the opportunity to just do what we want when it comes to God. Make our own way to God. Makes sense to me. We need just to, and I've seen that bumper sticker, that coexist bumper sticker. We just need to coexist. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Or as the great theologian Taylor Swift said, you need to calm down. We need to let everybody live and be happy. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, and, and I think too, the Bible needs to change. After all, don't cultures change? Yeah. Do, doesn't societies change? Yeah, yeah. Everything changes. Why, why shouldn't the Bible change? There's a way. There's a way that seems right. That seems right. All of those things seem right. Sometimes I think we become so disoriented about that. You know, uh, Amazon, you know, you get on there, you order something, here's 3,000 people, give it all five stars, and it's the greatest thing, and, and, since sli- and here it is. All these people can't be wrong. It, if it's right for everybody else in the world, well, it ought to be right. That seems right, doesn't it? It sure seems right. Or maybe, since everybody's seeing it this way, and I'm not seeing it the way everybody else sees it. Maybe I'm just seeing it wrong. Yeah, that's it. it. 
I, I've just been seeing it wrong all along. Everybody else must be right. That seems right. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe it seems right because I want it to be right. Yeah, that's what's going to make it right. There's a way that just seems right to me. Well, the other side of that, here's what God says in Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah, chapter 55. He says this in verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Hmm, my ways, he says, nor are my ways, he says, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, God is saying, you know what? You might not fully understand everything in the word that I've given you. You might not fully understand or comprehend why I have decided and I have, before the world began, decided that baptism is for the remission of sins. That's what's going to make you a Christian. That's what's going to add you to the body of Christ. That's what's going to save your soul. You might not fully understand that. You might not fully understand the acts of worship that a New Testament church carries out every single Lord's Day. You might not fully comprehend that. And, and that might not be your way. And that not might be your thought. But, and you might not understand why there's one exception for divorce. You might not understand why I am concerned about your character. You might not understand why I'm concerned about your influence, your heart, your integrity, all those things. You might not fully understand that. But who are we? Especially who are we to vocalize to God? God, I think my way's better. I think the way I'm thinking is a lot better than the way you're thinking. I tell you, folks, we become disoriented. Who's the boss? We become disoriented because there's been a huge shift about whose ways. We need to appeal to. And whose thoughts we need to appeal to. Well, it just seems right sometimes because I think we become desensitized. We lose our feeling. We've lost our feeling. A lot of us lost our feeling morally, ethically, spiritually. And so a lot of, a lot of things just, just doesn't affect us. Just doesn't affect us like it, like it should, like it used to. I like what the prophet Jeremiah says. Chapter 8, verse 12. He says, are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? Question mark. You're not even ashamed of this kind of conduct? What you see going on? No, they have no shame at all. Not even enough to blush. Therefore, they will fall among the fallen. When I punish them, they will collapse, says the Lord. The concept of sin. Sin. Well, that's an interesting word. <clears throat> what we've done with that word in our American vocabulary is we've just pretty well done away with it. And I'll tell you what, that even includes, is inclusive in the realm of religion. Religious publications I get all the time. Here, here's what's going on in the broader evangel evangelical world. Listen to this. <clears throat> I read statements like this. Let's confess our struggle with human relational Dynamics, yeah, man. Or let's target holiness as a growth objective. Okie dokie. Let's, let's hit that. I never read, let's deal with the reality of sin. Don't read that. We don't want to talk about it that way. We become desensitized to sin in so many ways. How does that happen? Well, I think a lot of times, I think what's happening is we, there's a familiarity that's happening now like it's never happened before. We just get used to stuff that's been going on forever. We've been fed it through the boot tube forever, for, and it's all around us now. We just get used to it. It's, it's no big deal. We just get used to it. How many times, and, I, and I've, I know, I don't know if I've used this illustration, I know you've heard it. You know, you walk into a movie theater late. You ever do that? Do, 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 and that's all that's going on. Everybody's got their chairs. And you go in that first step and the door shuts behind you. It's so dark you can't see your hand. If you stand there for, it doesn't take long. What happens? Your eyes start to adjust. 
you start to see the seeds, you start to see people's heads, everything starts to get real clear. And I'll tell you what, sometimes we get so used to living in the dark, don't we? And, 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 and this dark world, and what happens is, well, we just get used to all the vulgarity that's happening around us. We just get used to all the profanity that's happening around us. We get used to all the immorality that's happening around us. Doesn't seem dark anymore. And, and it doesn't seem wrong anymore. Why is that? Because we got used to it. We've gotten used to it. We have a saying in America that, that familiarity breeds contempt. But I believe it breeds far more than that. I, I believe it breeds indifference. I believe familiarity breeds indifference. We get used to things and it just, just doesn't bother us anymore. And all the euphemisms out there and, and the political correctness out there and, and all those things, we want to soften. We want to get rub, rub off all those rough edges when it comes to sin. And, and we, we use words to do that. We use adult a lot. Don't you know we're all adults here? Yes. So, so the word adult, forn fornication is just an adult relationship, don't you know? That's, that's what that means. And, and pornography is just adult entertainment. Yeah, that, that's what that is. And, and, and profanity, you know what that is. That's, that's adult language. Yeah. And, and the, other, the other word that we use, alternate. Alternate. That's not homosexuality. That's an alternate lifestyle. And, and that's not lying. That's just alternate facts. And we use those words back and forth. We soften sin with, with the language that we've come up with in, in our country. And television, again, movie breaks the barriers of that. And a lot of things that we see on TV and we, you know what? It makes me laugh. It makes me laugh. And I think we need to take a real good look at that sometimes. Because if I'm laughing at sin and laughing at the things that, that breaks the heart of God, Maybe I need to take a, another look at that. And along with that, I think sometimes too, why things just seem, I think sometimes we're just naive. And, and I know we shouldn't be, but we don't pay a lot of attention to the, to the warnings that God gives us. That we kind of just slough them off. Uh, when was it? Last, it was this past spring, there was four people in a period of eight days that fell to their death in the Grand Canyon. It was a, an engaged couple and two individuals. And really, three different occasions, four people fell to their death. And, and they did it because they were taking selfies. Now, everybody takes selfies, all right? But where they were doing it, it was clearly marked. They, they stepped over the line. Warning, don't go here. Warning, don't pass this. Warning, there's danger here. All four of those people ignored those warnings. And ultimately, it seemed right like to them, I'm sure, but it ended up that way killed them. And, and when you believe that the rules apply to everybody but you, that's what's going on. And, and, and how naive is that to, to think that? And if you think that, I'll tell you, nothing good's going to come from that. If everything in the book here is for everybody but you, you're on the wrong course. You're thinking wrong. There's a phrase in the New Testament. It's used three times, three distinct times, three distinct messages when it's used, and it's used only three times. And the phrase is, be not deceived. Be not deceived. First time, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says in verse 33, he says, be not deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Now, we probably wouldn't say be not deceived. What we'd say is don't fool yourself. You can stop fooling yourself. Bad company corrupts good morals. You're not a special case. You're fooling yourself if you think you're a special case. Your friends, your closest, most intimate friends, the people you spend the most time with will profoundly impact the direction of your life. No exception to that. Don't be deceived. The people that you spend the majority of your time with will impact you morally, ethically, spiritually, every walk of your life. And I'll tell you what they'll do. 
they'll either draw you closer to God in your walk to God or they'll drive you farther away from him. Galatians chapter 6. Paul says in verse 7, don't fool yourself. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. The reason God is not mocked is because in this world, when he set up things, he laid down some principles that will always happen, that will always work. You can count on it. Gravity. I never got up this morning and worried if I was going to float away. I wish the grandkids would have floated away a couple of times. But ever that, <laughs> gravity still worked. It held them in the, it never held them in the same place, but it kept them on the earth. That's a principle. That's a principle that you can count on. Paul says, don't be deceived. God's put some principles in this world. If you plant corn, you're not going to get cantaloupe. And you can count on it. And, and well, what do we say? Hey, hey, I'm in control here. I know how this looks. And I know what you think about what, what you see going on. With who I'm with, how I'm living, all those things. But listen, I've got this. Don't worry. No, no, you're fooling yourself. You're going to reap exactly what you're sowing. There'll be consequence to your life. There'll be consequence to your behavior. That is a principle that God gives. That truth is certain. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't fool yourself. Fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals will inherit the kingdom of God. Everything in our culture says that's not true. That's not, that's not true. We're bombarded with that's not true. Especially this past June. Pride Month. Proud to be gay. Proud to be a homosexual. We're bombarded with that. Paul says, don't you fool yourself. You think God's going to turn a blind eye and to raise up his hands, everything's high, it's all okay with me? Paul says, no. Don't you fool yourself. Why can't we see, why can't we see that the way seems right, and, but, but the end's death? Well, I think we've become disoriented. And, and I think we've been desensitized to a lot of things, and I think in a lot of ways we're naive about what's happening all around us. Second question, how can we see? How can we see? How can we correct our vision as we're looking at this? You know, we sing songs in our church about seeing a lot of things. And I think we mean what we sing. We need to sing with the spirit and understanding. We need to sing in a worshipful way to God, to, to glorify God, to edify ourselves, build ourselves up. See Jesus. We sing songs about seeing Jesus and seeing heaven and all those things. And, and I think we mean that when we sing that. I've talked to people that had that uh, 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 ADD, cataract surgery. They had the cataract surgery. And it always amazes me. Hey, I seen something funky on Facebook the other day about uh, the cataract thing. You don't have to do the eye surgery anymore. They're going to make drops now where you do that and clears it up or something. I don't know. Anyway, they're always they, here, here's Here's what it never fails. Boy, I'll tell you what. I didn't know how bad my vision was until I got that surgery. Oh, man. Oh, I can see better than I can when I, when I was 18. It's just amazing, the vision, how it improves. And now, I never had the surgery, but as you can see, I have the glasses. And it's interesting. When they put these things on me, I thought, <laughs> I can see. It, I, I thought, you know, and I think everybody has that same reaction. You just don't know how bad your vision is. Till you put those glasses on, and every year when you go back, you know, five years later for your yearly checkup, and they and they and they do the prescription, and you go, you can see again, and your vision's all clear. I tell you, folks, it can happen to us spiritually. It happens to us spiritually where, where our vision changes, and we're just seeing things that's happening, and and it's just cloudy, not clear. And things are just happening. And then one day we realize, wow, man, I should have seen this a long time ago. I've been blind to all of these things so long. My vision is clear. How do we clear it up? Well, I hope you're paying attention to what 
uh, was read by Mickey in 1 Thessalonians. As we're looking at that chapter, let's turn to that chapter, chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians. What Paul says in this chapter, he says there's a difference between the informed and those that are uninformed. He said there's a big difference here in the believer and the non-believer in this text. And, and, and he's, he's talking about what a difference it is for those that are prepared for the Lord to come. Not going to blindside them when the Lord to come. No, that's not going to happen. There's a big difference in those that are looking forward for the Lord to come and a difference for those that are not going to have anything but the wrath of God. In other words, there's a big difference in the child, the, the child of light, child of day, and the child of night. Now, when Paul writes this, he's not talking about, hey, I've uncovered some kind of secret here, some mystery that nobody really knows, and he's not trying to impress you with some secret or I, I'm better than you because I've discovered more than you. I, I say in this chapter, and you can study that, Paul's saying exactly what Solomon said in Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seems right to you. There's a way that seems right to you, but the end is death. And what he's saying in this, just in this chapter, is that we need to make a choice about that. Paul is, is warning us here in this chapter. Paul's a driver's ed teacher. He'd be saying, put your hand on 10 and 2 o'clock, fasten your seat belt, obey all traffic lights, all signs, everything. And he's warning you. He's getting you ready to hit the road. Yeah, meteorologist, I, don't, I know these are poor illustrations, but when you think about that guy, hey, listen, tornado's coming. Final clouds in Peaburg. It's heading this way. The warning is there. And, he, and, he's, and he's getting, but Paul's not a driver's ed teacher. He's not a meteorologist. He's an apostle. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. And in Thessalonians 5, he says, don't you be naive. Don't you be naive to the dangers of your soul. Don't you become so comfortable with what's going on in the world that you don't feel what you should feel. And you don't think how you should think. That's what he's saying here. Let's look at verse 12. He says, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you, have charge over you in the Lord, give you instruction, that you esteem them very highly in love because of the work, live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. When you look at that, literally there's a, probably about a dozen points here that Paul makes in this chapter. But I want you to notice four particular points. Number one, he says that you do what? Pray without ceasing. Now, that doesn't mean have an attitude of prayer. I'm going to tell you something. If everybody that said to me, I'm going to pray for you, prayed for me, wow. Wow. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. Really? I hope you do. There's a big difference in I've got a great attitude when it comes to prayer. Love prayer, but not pray. That's two different things. Well, God's not keeping score how many times you pray. He's not up there interested in that. But I need to pray without ceasing every day because, folks, God answers prayer. Prayer is powerful. We need to recognize that. And he says you need to always, what? Test everything. Discern, here he says. Don't listen to what your culture says. Is right. Line it up with the word of God. What's the word of God say about what's going on now? How does it stack up? When you do that, you are discerning. You're taking a good look at what the book says. Test everything. Really examine yourself. Test yourself. Am I falling for it? The way that seems right, but the end is death. Am I going for what they're saying? Test that. Look at the culture you live in. Do you believe it? Do you believe, have you bought the package of what they're selling out there? What do you think? How are you living? Does it line up with the word of God? And again, look again. You look at it, Paul says, well, actually in Timothy, he talks about 
taking heed to yourself, the doctrine that, that's been given to you, continue in those things. And really, when I look at verse 22, he says, abstain from every appearance of evil. That, that'd keep us out of a lot of trouble, wouldn't it? That'd just keep us out of a lot of trouble if we just abstain from every appearance of evil. I just look at those four points. Always praying, always testing, always keeping, always abstaining. Do you know what they are? They're proactive. That, that means that you're busy doing that. You're actually doing something. And Paul says, really, nobody's just going to blindly stumble their way into heaven. No, sir. Not going to do it. Not going to kick her in neutral and just kind of coast in. That's, that's not what he's saying. Every single one of us must actively pursue heaven. Folks, you've got to make heaven the goal of your life. This is an active thing that we're in, involved in. The church is active. The Christian is active. And the things that we see going on around us, you have to take an active approach to deny those things. There's another individual in history besides Wrong Way Corrigan that went the wrong way. 90 years ago, the 1929 Rose Bowl, California, Georgia Tech. There's a guy named Rory Regals. And he picked up a fumble and took off running for California. Yeah, he took off running for California, all right. He took off running the wrong way. And he was running that football the wrong way. He was so excited. He got disoriented, and he was running the wrong way. And boy, I'll tell you what, the Georgia Tech guys were cheering him on because as soon as he crossed that goal line, it was going to be their points. And the coach of Georgia Tech said, boys, shut your mouths and sit down. And he said these words, every step he takes is to our advantage. He's right about that. They tackled him on the two-yard line. He didn't score, by the way. Brethren, let me say that every step you take, every step you take, either leads you closer to heaven or it leads you farther away from God. And, and that's just the truth about life. That's the truth about Christianity. Spiritually, there's, there's no neutral. There's a way that seems right, but the end thereof is death. There's a pilot that went the wrong direction. As a football player that went the wrong direction, folks, we've got to make sure we don't end up doing that in a way that seems right. Please get your songbooks out. If you have faith in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you confess that before this audience, you can be baptized for the remission of your sins. You can repent of your sins, be baptized. I can promise you, folks, you're on the right way. You've done everything the Bible says to become a Christian, a child of God. There's no wrong in that. That's the right. Seemed right? It seems right, all right, because it is right. It's what the Bible says. If you failed the Lord and sinned in a public way that is known and you want the public to repent of that, God will forgive you. We'll pray with you, whatever you need. Please come as together we stand and sing.